Okay, so good evening uh, and welcome to General Council uh, of May 24th. Uh, I'll first begin by identifying any media that's on the line. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bree. For the record, that's Bree from the Turtle Island News. Is there any others? representatives uh, from the Two World Times. Okay, seeing or hearing none, I'm gonna move then into our, any changes or deletions uh, looking to the agenda. And if not, uh, looking for a mover in seconder to adopt uh, this evening's uh, General Council of May 24th agenda. Move, Audrey. I'll move, it's Melba. Okay, thank you. Moved by Audrey and seconded by Melba. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Mark, it's Hazel. Or rather, all in favor? Motion's carried. Sorry, Hazel. Yeah, I'm having a difficult time staying connected here, but I wanted to add to this agenda or under new business. Sorry, go ahead, Hazel. You there? Yeah, yeah I want to add um, to the agenda. Sure, and what's your addition? Conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. Okay, thank you. Is that okay with the mover and seconder? I yes. see Helen. Yes, it's good with me. Thank you, thank you, Audrey. Helen has her hand raised. Helen? I have the uh, Stone Ridge Church, Stone Ridge Church, and I have uh, an award that's being presented to Crystal Farmer. Okay, so there's two additional items uh, for Helen, including uh, Hazel's. Again, just looking to the mover and seconder. Is that okay? Good for that's me. That's fine with me, Melba. Okay, thank you, uh, Melba and Audrey. Anything further? Seeing or hearing them then uh, with those three additional items uh, in our agenda that you see, it's been moved and seconded all in favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing that motion is carried. Uh, we have a number of delegations this evening. Uh, I'll first, uh, we're gonna jump right into our delegation and presentation portion of the, the agenda. I'll first begin with Alma, uh, the Executive Director at Brantford Native Housing, uh, as well as I believe joining her is Claire, the Research Assistant uh, at Brantford Native Housing. So uh, with that being said, welcome uh, this evening uh, to General Counsel, to both of you ladies, uh, and we'll pass the floor right over to yourself to begin your presentation. We usually go about 10, 15 minutes to each and then for any Q and A's. So with that being said, welcome, uh, and I'll pass the floor right over to yourself. Now, Thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this and me in presenting to all of you today. Um, we presented a, a PowerPoint. Um, having said that, I have the PowerPoint right here. I don't know if I have access to share it. Yes, yes, you should have access. You just go down to your share screen and it should work. Oh, perfect. There we go. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me see if I can do this more. I actually mute audio. I actually don't have access to share my screen. Okay, sorry if I could just look to Shirley. Oh, Claire's. Claire, you're screen. awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Okay, so I will begin. Um, my name is Alma Arguello, and my native name, my Mayan name is Anupucha Pepeche Akicha Alata. And I am from Honduras, and I am from the Maya Akikalata tribe. So my I would like to come to council and ask your permission and honor to be able to present today. 
My presentation today is about a new development that we would like to propose uh, for um, on behalf of Brand for Native Housing. So, so here we go. So the next slide. Thank you, Claire. Can you click? Because I don't have access to it. Awesome. So urban indigenous housing has been something that has been a systemic barrier for since uh, time immemorial. And it has a lot to do with a lot of the systemic barriers, especially that were imposed around the Indian Act. But especially in Branford, one of the biggest things that we have noticed is that a lot of our urban indigenous population has been um, mis well, we have had a lot of homelessness and there, even though according to the homeless pit count, which is the point in count and given time that you see homeless population within Brantford region, um, we, when they did the count, they found 156 individuals that, were, that actually participated in actually said I'm homeless. Within that 58% of individuals self-identify as indigenous. So that makes up a 37%. Having said that, it does not actually capture the whole notion or the whole number of indigenous homeless population that actually happens in Brantford and Brant County within a given night. We know for a fact that 16 of that folks within 150 range were not necessary. So there were 156, but 16 did not, who were too spirited, were not counted within the within this pit count. Also, we know for a fact that hidden homelessness is also not captured within this uh, bracket. Um, we have seen within brand for native housing an increase of homelessness, especially hidden homelessness or untouched homelessness. So what that means is women who are sick, who are homeless with children and who are currently couch surfing who are currently staying at friends' house, who are staying in non-residential areas with their children. So this has actually increases the notion of family homelessness within the indigenous, urban indigenous community within Brantford. At this point, urban indigenous people are disproportionately over, but not completely captured in the point in time homeless count that the city of Brantford actually does. The next slide. Um, in terms of urban indigenous housing portfolio, um, it has come to our knowledge, provincial and federally, that this is actually something that is at risk. Uh, so June 1st, uh, Brantford Native Housing actually will have no more capacity to home, to house anybody else. We have actually used all of our housing stock or some of our housing stock is actually not suitable for living. So at this point, we are looking at to see how we could increase our housing. We know for a fact 80% of our women that come to Brent for Native Housing for housing, whether it's transitional housing or non-transitional housing, all of them have children. But when it comes to transitional housing, um, most of our women do have, 85% of our women have children, which actually creates a barrier. So we know for a fact that, and it is harder for women to leave a place for violence with children. We know for a fact that that is even bigger impacted with urban indigenous communities. Next slide. Um, we know for a fact that violence is a leading cause of women and homelessness in Canada, and we know for a fact that it is also within the within the realm of hidden homelessness that actually happen. There are more incidents of victim of crime, women exploitation, and human trafficking when it happens in this aspects of things. Indigenous women are also three times more likely than non-Indigenous women to be obviously victimized of crimes. But we know within the Brantford uh, and Brant County kind of umbrella, those numbers are not captured. The numbers that we have captured within our transitional housing 
has been that 100% of the women have experienced some form of domestic violence, uh, sexual assault, or domestic abuse. Um, poverty and homelessness has also been a cyclical issue that has come within the transitional model. Um, and that is something that we have tried to address. Next slide. Um, so proposed development. Brand for Native Housing purchased a building back in 2002. The building was originally built in, in the 60s, I believe, early 70s. This building has had a lot of structural issues to it, to the point that it's just too, it's not feasible for us to continue fixing it. At this point, this building actually hosts, has eight units. And within the state units, we have only been able to rent five units because we cannot morally and ethically move in people there. So the H, uh, H CMHC, Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation, came in with a proposal. And this proposal is to expand transitional housing for women and children. We are proposing to host and to house and increase housing from our current eight units currently that we actually have that are that ill prepared so currently in our units women and their children sleep in the same bedroom we are proposing that actually folks come to our second stage housing and have space at that which they're able to um, have room for their children um, have their own kitchen have programming have indigenous such as BRISC, NIWASA, uh, the Aboriginal Health Network and, and BNH come to them and actually provide services, have a form of wraparound support and a client support sector that is something that has not been happening in Brantford. So this will be a very unique model. After that, we are hoping, the next slide, sorry. <laughs> so after that, we're hoping to um, eventually start transitioning women into affordable housing and something that they're more common, something that is more used, something that they're more into community. One of the biggest barriers that we have found when it comes to creating transitional housing within our community is that there is no connection to community. So we want to be able to create that connection to community right away. So if you're leaving and if you get assessed to be part of this amazing project is how can we provide you services and completely wrap around, work with the services that are around you rather than just be part of a system that continually oppress you and continually systematically tends to pick you apart. So um, we're able to provide sustainable housing for them by fixing some of our housing stock that we currently have with some of the provincial and federal money that hopefully will come at our end to be able to fix the houses that currently are not suitable to be able to move this woman in and then be able to empower individuals for them to start building their lives. Uh, my thought is not to create just a house, but to create a home. How do we transition people from providing them a house, providing them community for it to become a home? So the children and the children's children are able to look and enjoy in their culture within that perspective. How do we incorporate community gardens for the children so they're able to learn about medicine within the urban setting? How do we communicate with them in terms of cultural competency and within that notion of having all of the urban indigenous com uh, community service provider be able to come to the transitional units and provide that support. Next slide. So this is where currently our 1960s, it is not necessarily equipped. Um, we know for a fact that our current insulation is Sawdust, and we have wall radiating heating, so it's not appropriate. It's literally, in my thing, it's not appropriate for people to live there. And also, we know for a fact that we have lead paint. So, how can we provide a place for a transitional second stage house for women and children to come in, build their life, 
sustainable with community, both cultural and uh, to actually be able to understand kind of the community components that are surrounded for them to be empowered, to be able to advocate for themselves. Next slide. That's all I have. <laughs> so I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. And like I say, I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity. And what I'm seeking today is to be able to secure a letter of support for this initiative. And what we are proposing is, is how can we work collaboratively with the urban community, um, especially with it, a second stage transitional housing for women and children, which we know is one of the biggest barriers that has actually come up in time and time and again um, of women losing their kids, women not being able to advocate for their children uh, because of lack of quote unquote proper housing. Um, and how do we support women within a cultural trauma-informed intersectional lens that actually allows them to thrive, not within a house perspective, but how do we give them a house and we as a community surround them to become a home? Thank you. Well, thank you, Niawa, so much, Alma, for, for walking us through uh, your presentation. I'm going to open the floor up for any questions uh, for Alma or Claire. Uh, but just before I do uh, open the floor up for further questions, I do have a question myself is what exactly, uh, where is this fund coming from that you're applying to? So the fund is coming from the Canadian Mortgage Housing Association. Um, and is a fund that we would be able to sustain this model for five, five to six years. After five to six years, this model will become um, just housing and part of it will be part, be, be part uh, of uh, transitional housing. And the reason why the model is this way is because they're hoping that we eventually just completely run it. But that is something that is systemically kind of wrong with the system in where they, they give us startup, startup money and they say, here you go, figure it out. Right. So at this point, we're saying, OK, we could figure it. We could figure it out with the support of the women and the support of community and where we could keep some of the housing as long term housing for some of the women, especially the women that have larger families. And they're going to have a harder time uh, finding and securing large houses. And these are the families that are three to four, uh, three to four children kind of household that are not going to be able to find a household within the quarter four Brantford standardized housing program. Yeah, and okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alma, for answering that question because I know our, our next delegation or presentation as well is, uh, looks like, uh, you know, applying to the same type of fund as well, uh, which is our, our, um, our ED of Gnukrashra. Uh, but again, you know, I think just really quickly, um, I'm just, uh, you know, Councillor Sherry Lynn and I have been trying to work uh, around some other areas as well in terms of collaborations, because uh, we do have a lot of, we have a lot of homelessness in the Brantford area and, and surrounding areas of our people. But a lot of the times, the, the issue that, that we're finding is the services in Brantford um, often, and I, and I hate to sound like this, but it's the reality, uh, they, they often use our numbers, you know, as Indigenous or members of Six Nations, and then they don't service them. Or they say, you know, the sorry funding's out or sorry funding, you, you're not eligible or, you know, the list goes on. Um, and so I do, I have some challenges with these types of services that are supposed to be, you know, looking at, uh, at everybody. Uh, and especially this is particular to indigenous people. You know, it's, it's, it's quite bothersome at times to, uh, you know, have, you know, these discussions, but still see our people suffer. You know, those to me, uh, you know, are, are, are things that I think need to be further addressed. And I, th I don't think that they can be further addressed until we have actual true partnerships and collaborations uh, with the different services across the city and so forth. So uh, I just wanted to, to, to put that out there for now uh, to see some of the what that um, can, you know, um, garner in terms of discussion. Uh, but that is some of the pieces that I've been seeing most recently in terms of, you know, servicing or rather different services within the Brantford area and just really surrounding areas. You know, it's all, at the end of the day, it's about funding. Uh, when we talk about funding, it's usually about data. 
and data then goes into our people. Our people then drive that data and it doesn't get back to the help that it needs. So I just wanna make that loud and clear. I see a number of hands being raised. I'm gonna go first over to Michelle uh, and then I see Sherry Lynn, Audrey and Helen. Michelle, you have the floor. Okay, sorry I'm late. Sorry I come in mid presentation. But um, I, I completely agree, we do need housing. I know that there's a variety, a, a diverse population that we all need to be servicing. So my question, and it's very much um, as the chief indicated, we have two delegations on tonight going to the same fund. So how have you worked with Gwinnakwestra? What is that uh, collaboration? But also I'm, I'm looking at, I've heard, and I, I agree, wraparound services, we've all talked about it for many years, but it doesn't seem to be happening. So how are you working with various um, native services within Brantford and Six Nations? Who are, who are those collaborators? Sorry if I missed that. Um, and also, how are you going to sustain um, the units after, should you receive the funds? So in terms of collaboration at this point, um, it has been a disconnect in terms of the urban indigenous uh, community in terms of that collaboration that actually happened. And to address the notion of a data, I think um, I'm, I'm new to my role, but in the past six months, I have collected that data both from Laurier University and also from Stats Canada. And the Stats Canada data and also the um, analytical data from Laura University, it does show that there is actually a huge need for a wraparound support in transitional, not just from transitional housing, but long-term housing support for women and children in Brantford. And that is something that has never actually been done in the past. The analytical data also shows an increase in, in this proportional need of Indigenous women in CIS, meaning that there's a huge disproportion of Indigenous women losing their children due to lack of secure housing that actually happens in Brantford. So that is a huge amount of data. When we talked about what is the urban and six nations, I think that we have to really look at the, at the picture itself in the relationship. Um, I am seeking here to have a more proactive relationship with the urban community. And that is a huge disconnect that I actually I have been reading about in the past 10 years in where Six Nations and the urban community have not necessarily been connected with urban services within Brantford. So for the past 10 years, there has been this disconnect in ad hoc services and support that has actually happened between Six Nations and the brand for urban um, indigenous community. So how can we solidify, solidify that relationship is something that I would love to do and I would love to continue to have this conversation. And that would be for us to continue to be invited to council. So how do that move forward? Number two, in terms of sustainability, that is a systemic issue that we're all facing. So this grant itself is only funded for five years. But, well, they say six years, but one of the year is construction years. So technically it's just five years. So when we look at the sustainability model, we know for a fact that Brand for Native Housing actually runs transitional units for women, youth, um, women, youth, men, and families currently in the city. So we do have over 15 years experience running transitional units with minimal government support. So this funding actually comes from the women itself, with it, which is, excuse me, the shelter and or uh, shelter allowance that is allocated for OW or ODSP. Based on that, that's how we are able to continue supporting the women um, until we find additional support in terms of how do we continue to move forward. In terms of collaborating with current urban indigenous community, that is a partnership that has to do based on a wraparound support based on the programming that the women need. Have a half conversation, I'll be honest with you at this particular moment, due to the level of hierarchical 
in where the funding is coming from. No, I have not had those direct conversations in terms of how programming would actually happen. Do we have a friendly understanding? And I'm hoping uh, that the delegations here are also successful in this grim because if there are more housing for women and children happen in Brantford or if they tell us, hey, can you guys figure it out together? I think that would be amazing as well. Um, having said that, the way that the funding is put together and the way that we are competing with funding is a very colonial component of patriarchal kind of mentality in where here is the funding, you gotta have to figure it out how you do it type of thing. We are working um, in terms of creating a program in a system that is inclusive and open. Um, I don't know if that answers your question in terms of I know it's like a fourth <laughs> component of question there, uh, but based on the data and the research that we have collected, both from Laurier and from Stats Canada, women and children are disproportionately not illustrated in any of the studies that actually Brentford has put forward. And based, they're heavily criminalized in the levels of homelessness and victimization and criminalization, especially for women, are much, much higher than white women are. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alma. Sorry, I just wanted to check in with Michelle uh, if there's anything further on your end, Michelle. Um, there is, but I'll, I'll pass. Okay, thanks. Uh, Thanks for that. Maybe perhaps we could come back uh, to you, Michelle. Uh, Sherry Lynn. Um, just a couple things in the sense of what the chief said. Um, we've been out in the community helping helping the homeless. And, um, I, you know, it's, it's nice to have this data. But when you go out on the street, nobody's there to help them. They'll tell you that. So I'm not sure um, <laughs> who's, uh, who's out in the community really gathering the true um, data and really helping and asking um, our people, our, our people who are um, homeless. And I guess with um, Councillor Michelle Bomberry's question, I, I never got the answer also is, what about the other native agencies? Uh, what have they said and supporting this? Um, that was the question, and that was some of the other questions that I had also. And um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> yeah, I'll just I'll just stick with those because I see other people have their hands up. So okay, okay thank, thank you, you. Uh, thank you, Sherry. Oh, sorry, thank, thank you, Sherry. Sherry Lynn. Lynn. I'll, I'll pass oh. it up to you, Alma. Okay, thank you, Sherry Lynn. So I will go back to the question about what about the other agencies, the urban agencies, um, as per my previous answer, we don't, uh, at this particular moment, I don't have a complete program wraparound because the program is like the way that the funding has come to us, it has been pretty much, it's called capital funding. So how many units can you put together? What is the programming that you're going to put together? How many women can you actually support? Um, the questions are more capital based. Having said that, the wraparound support that we would like to put, it would be a more a client informed trauma informed perspective with an intersectional lens. What that means is looking at each woman and their children based on their case for case basis. And now how can we incorporate some of the programs that the urban indigenous community currently have? We know for a fact that a lot of the urban indigenous communities such as Brest, some of us have lost funding within the urban, urban indigenous envelope. So that is something that is a systemic issue that we have been doing dirt. When it comes to who is asking, who is seeking for that data, there's three types of that data. When it comes to indigenous, urban indigenous communities, that data is never going to be corrected. And the reason is because it's not advantageous to, for that data to be actually publicated that way. So we know for a fact that when we did the point in, point in time, which is called the pit count that is done once a year, and that is with Stats Canada, that is the data that which I presented, which is 156, which 16 urban indigenous people were actually excluded. Um, we also know for a fact that the encampment data 
shows no indigenous communities as well. That data is based out of the city of Brantford data. And when it comes to advocacy for urban indigenous population and urban indigenous advocate agencies such as Brentford Native Housing to be part of those spaces is something that we are still struggling because if we are not part of that conversation and if we are not part of those table discussions and if we are not part of how do we frame those questions, then we are never going to be from part of those conversations. So that is a systemic issue that I'm hoping that with advocacy and continuous support from the other urban indigenous communities, and especially with um, Mr. Mr. Um, Isaac Jacobs, who is now part of city council, not city council, but within the Brentford City quote unquote municipality. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we are able to have kind of a united voice in terms of to better advocate uh, to that point. I hope, Sherilyn, that will answer your question. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alma. I do have a couple other hands raised as well, but just, just what I'm gathering at this point in time, you know, I, I don't see, I mean, I think it's, it's premature at this point because there's not been any other conversations with direct, you know, programs, providers or services. Um, you know, how are those collaborations going to work? Is that a possibility? You know, like if we were to, uh, you know, support this, uh, this letter, I mean, obviously we all agree housing is an issue. Homelessness is an issue. We have that on reserve as well. We have many members in Brantford, again, who are being underserviced. Um, and it, just with these, you know, these types of proposals, it's obviously not working. So I, th I don't think uh, we have to get more creative uh, in this process. And I think there's got to be more communication with our own program services here on territory to see exactly how that collaboration and partnership would look like. That's just what I'm gathering so far. Uh, Audrey, and then over to Helen. Audrey, you have the floor. Hello. Um, I think that Stats Canada data that you uh, speak to, I think it could be um, not accurate. I don't know how many, how they collect their data, but, but for them to actually go out in the streets and talk to people, I don't think that's, that's something that they do. So I don't think it's very reliable. And I think we have a uh, situations in our own territory here that we have to address, which is homelessness. And I think that your program needs to talk to our program to see if there is any overlap, to see if there's any way that you can work together. But I would also like to know what contribution or what uh, assistance uh, the mayor of Brant or da mayor, mayor, uh, David, uh, sorry, Kevin Davis is doing and Mayor uh, David Bailey for the Brant County, have you approached them and um, are they contributing to this? Are they contributing with any kind of wraparound services or any uh, financial um, assistance to, to sustain this? Because homelessness isn't just for five years. You know, some people may get back on their feet, but then again, when, you, when they get back on their feet, there are other people who, who may Need, will need that service, not may, will need that service. So I think that collaboration needs to be done. We need to sit down and talk with it uh, together. And I think we need to involve um, both mayors as well because we need the leadership and trying to do it grassroots is good, but they're able to do the political adv advocacy. And maybe there are more areas where we can get funding for the homeless in Brantford for native housing, because I'm, I fully support having uh, housing for our, our women and our, our children. They can't live on the streets. They can't live on couch surfing. It's not sustainable to grow healthy people that way. So I, I'll, I'm totally for it, but I also totally for working together on this now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Audrey. Maybe perhaps Alma, you can just touch on the, uh, the portion of, you know, what supports or has there been any uh, support uh, from the city or the county? So thank you so much, Audrey. So in terms of um, overlap services, um, I would love to have overlap services for Six Nation, especially when it comes to cultural competency with our some of our women and children who are coming from outer Brantford or who, are, who leave 
reserved to come to Brantford. I think that would be phenomenal and I will urge and I would love to have further conversation. Like I said before, there has been over the 10 years, there has been this huge disconnect within between urban, urban communities. And I know for a fact, my agency, Brantford Native Housing, and then in terms of how can we work that. In terms of assistance from Brant County and the mayor, um, the mayor and we actually have full support from the city of Brantford. The city of Brantford is willing to support us as well with a letter of support. In addition to that, they're willing to give us capital funding to, for moving forward past the five years um, that will go forward with this proposal. So they are fully aware and believe you me, um, I think that I have been a thorn <laughs> or just an advocate, a very good advocate in where in terms of really putting into forward when it comes to reconciliation is actually putting their actions where the mouth is. And I really believe at this point, based on the relation that Brantford Native Housing has trying to foster with the city of Brantford, we are trying to build those relationships. Um, we have been in conversation in terms of how we could use some of the vacant land from Brantford and see how we could actually start developing um, in order for us to move forward in terms of start really and start the conversation in terms of how we could actually address some of the urban indigenous homelessness um, that they know for a fact is underrepresented and undercounted in a lot of their numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know I, I, I do want to start to draw uh, this discussion to, the, to a close. So I'm going to head over to Helen at this point and then start to look to next steps. Helen, you have the floor. The only concern I have, I, I mean, I, I see it as a good uh, initiative, but the only concern I have is for people on the reserve to access this initiative, they would have to move into Brantford. They have to be living in Bradford in order to access it. They can't access it if they're living on a reserve. And secondly, I don't recall council, I don't recall urban ho uh, native housing ever coming to council asking for a resolution to support funding. So I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know why your funding, is it your funding source asking for it or is it you asking for it? Because I don't know where that's coming from. They've never done it before asked us for a letter of support to get funding. So I'm just wondering what that is about. Absolutely. Helen, thank you so much for your question. I really appreciate it. Um, and I think that that is when I spoke at the beginning is how do we build those relationships, right? And I wanna, I, the reason why I'm here and I'm honored to be here is to speak with numbers. Because if, if we don't speak and we don't stand on the shoulders of great people uh, like the founder of Brantford Native Housing, like the founder of Brest, like of Nawasa, of all this urban indigenous agency that actually has stood up and say enough is enough and our people are actually need to be taken care of. And here I am today saying, I cannot do this without your support. And I cannot address this issue without your support. And as being able to echo, not to echo and break down the barriers of a lot of the urban indigenous communities that actually has happened in where they are not necessarily being heard or counted uh, when it comes with the mainstream. Um, uh, so, I am asking for a letter of support, um, but I'm also asking for your support um, because most of our urban indigenous community comes from Six Nations. And I wanna be able to stand frank and stand clear with them and stand clear with CMHC and say, this is an actually systemic need that is needed in that community. And this is something that we actually actually need to do. This is, I, I guess, if this has never happened with Brantford Native Housing, and I do, I think, historically want to apologize if that's the case, and be open and create that space. Um, but if this is the first opportunity, I hope this is one of many. 
Yeah, well, just as a follow up. Um, so I guess what I'm understanding is that you're using, as Mark had said earlier, you're using Six Nations numbers to get this funding. No, I'm only using urban indigenous numbers in Brandon. Because I heard you say something about counting of numbers. Yeah, so the counting on numbers are only from urban indigenous, not from Six Nations at all. I'm looking at A it. lot of them are from here though. We have a lot of people living in Brantford from here, but I, that's just my concern is they've never, like I said, people, I, I know a lot of people that have tried to access native housing and they've gotten turned down because they don't live in Brantford. So two-spirited people living in Six Nations and might want to access an apartment and they might be told no, because you're not living in Bradford. I have a concern about that. I would rather support this kind of funding going to us, <laughs> to our, our shelters and our different people that are gonna help people on the reserve. We need help on the reserve too. And I have a real concern because I see a lot of the money going to urban natives. And I, and I know the government has a reason for doing that because I think they want us all to move off reserve. So they, they just keep pouring money into urban, urban, it's all urban, urban, and we're not getting much of it here. And, and I know there's a plan behind that. So that's one of my concerns. But anyway. No, Helen, you're I appreciate right. your, your, uh, your yeah. um, presentation and the thing that you wanna do for the people, because I know a lot of them are our people from Six yeah. Nations, so. Helen, I just want to say, absolutely, I absolutely agree with you. There is this push for urbanization that has happened. And this is historically something that has been systemically pushed, especially by the federal yeah. government due to colonization and how women actually lost their status if they moved to urbanization. So I completely agree with you. But this is also an opportunity for me in terms of how we collaborate within Six Nations to actually collaboratively work something. It would be phenomenal for us to collaboratively within a program together. So I see Shifts yeah. Hill saying, really stop it. I'll and stop. <laughs> I, just because on a point that you made, on a point that you just made in terms of collaboration, I just think you're doing things a little bit backwards. I mean, at first, the collaboration should have come up front and not saying that it still can't. I mean, our goal is to work with our neighbors. Our goal is to work with everyone across the board who services all of our members, regardless of where they live. But the fact remains, if you want to make real change, then maybe start to look at some of your own policies, maybe start to look at those systemic changes that you can make within your own brand for native housing, maybe I'll get some more Six Nations members on your board of directors maybe look to see how the future collaborations can work with other programs and services. Like, I think there's just so much work that could have went in prior to coming and asking straight up for a letter of su support at the, at the front end. I just think those are, those are some of my pieces because it, it gets frustrating for me because I see this happening as Sherry Lynn has mentioned, we've been on, we've been on the front lines. We went to the streets to go and talk to some of these individuals. I don't think people even talk to them at times and if you actually go and 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 see you know some of the populations of the homeless community within Brantford I mean I think you, you get a better sense of what the actual needs are uh, and that's something for me and not again saying any uh, don't mean any disrespect by any means but I'm saying if we want to talk about true collaboration and partnership well then let's do that but let's do that in pr prior to getting you know the almost like getting our ducks in order first before we go in for the gusto type that's my Absolutely. point. Absolutely. Uh, Chief, I Nathan just want to and, correct you right now, but five of my board members are from Six Nations. And Lisa, I that, see that's, that's, great. That, that's, that's phenomenal. Thank you for, for, for clarifying. And even further to that, that's what we're trying to say. How do we do it to make sure we're collaborating even better with the programs and services on the territory? Again, I do appreciate the clarification. I'm going to go over to Nathan at this point and then to Melba and then start to shift to next steps. Nathan, you have the floor. Well, you cut down my speaking time, Chief, because uh, everything you just said is, is where I wanted to pull in. And, and it is about relationships, right? And the only thing I'll add to that is um, one of the things as it relates to relationships is, is communication. And, and 
constant communication coming in. So if, if I'm developing a relationship with somebody, I want that person to know as much about uh, uh, me as I possibly can and provide them an opportunity in those avenues to go back and forth. Um, all while uh, I, I develop that relationship with the other person. So it's got to be reciprocal. And, and, and the point's classic, right? If, if we had known five board members are on your board, you know, that's, that's a piece of information that's very vital in those relationship buildings. Um, the only thing I'll offer is, is I think, I, uh, I, I don't want to belabor the point. I think you get the relationship piece and the fact that there could have been a lot more done uh, at the front end of this. Um, it, it's never, um, doesn't feel good to, to start off a relationship with, hey, here's this big ask uh, in terms of the funding. Had we um, had, you know, had a lot of this work and, and had Sandra been involved uh, earlier on, having you both present a, a fabulous, robust program on this, um, we, I think our women and, and those that are in need would have been in a better position. And I'm not faulting anyone. Uh, by any means, don't get me wrong. Uh, but at the same time, um, what I'm kind of hearing as well is, is the need that this is a really good initiative. Um, if we have time, let's develop some uh, relationships and, and look at the, the programming that can be linked with all of this because it's a fabulous initiative and, and we know our most vulnerable need that type of housing, but it's also important as, as others have pointed out that the programming be super strong. And, and I don't want programming to be an afterthought. I want it to be front and center, super strong programming that we can all stand behind. That's what I want to see first. Um, you know, the capital and everything, I get it. And, and Helen's right. You know, government is doing this for a reason, divide and conquer. Uh, and, you know, um, we, we fall into that trap every single time. Uh, but that's something I would just offer is, is I would rather um, look at strong programming that's going to reverse the trends that you highlighted in all of your presentations, those numbers. Um, and that for me has to come first and then, you know, that support going forward. But, you know, I'm supportive of the initiative and, and looking at ways, but how, how best can we look at rectifying some of these uh, relationship and communication pieces? And again, putting that strong programming first front and center uh, before I look at anything else, kind of where I'm coming from. So, uh, yeah, I'll go. Now, now after that, thank you, uh, Nathan, for your comments. I have Melba in line next. Yes, um, I'll try to be short. There's been a lot of lot said. So I fail to understand uh, why you're separating two-spirited women on Six Nations here with our relationship with the Director of Housing and other staff. We do not do that. We do not discriminate against uh, people who think or feel and sometimes live differently than we do. So I would um, suggest that we look at that. Also, um, we have a lot of people that are presently in Brantford because we have not enough housing. Social and health have numerous people in the city of Brantford in hotels as a result of our need for housing. And I would think that we're gonna really need more, I guess, um, counseling and safety and protection and various other things as a result of COVID as well as the, the lost children. So we need to consider that in our community. And I realize a lot of this is gonna be from yours as well as other, other uh, native communities also. So I think more uh, disturbances are yet to be experienced. So we need to consider how we're gonna manage these. And we here on Six Nations have two uh, second stage housing, it's called, where we certainly consider who needs housing for, for the protection and the safety of our people here at Six Nations. So we are struggling just as you are in the eight urban centers. So uh, as was suggested, we need a closer rela relationship 
a closer understanding of your data as well as uh, uh, how we can work together. As they said, Nathan, as well as the chief and others, relationships are utmost importance to understand and work together where we can all, all assist one another in many, many ways. Thank you for, for your presentation and we certainly have great understanding of what your problems are with housing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Melba, for, for your comments as well. So, Alma, just, just really quickly, just based upon the comments and the, the discussion thus far, uh, what is the deadline of submission? So, uh, would it be okay if I address some of the questions that were put forward? 100%. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So, um, like I say, five of my board members are employed within Six Nations, and they are the co-founders of Brand for Native Housing. Uh, when it tried to in terms of relationship with Six Nations, I think I have been trying to advocate actually to Mr. Sh um, for the chief office uh, since the beginning of April. And this was the first opportunity and where I was able to present uh, without an opportunity to actually meet you face to face, Chief Hill. Uh, when it comes to relationship, I absolutely believe that relationship is the foundation of collaboration and is the foundation of echoing systemic um, oppression towards change. Um, in us an advocate and especially with an experience in sexual violence within the past seven years and I ran a sexual assault center and I understood very deeply the systemic and intersectional lens in where women and children and two-spirit folks are actually left out of conversation time and time again. Um, just to address uh, Nathan in terms of the relationships piece and in your um, aspects of strong programming, I absolutely agree with you, but programming has to be within the needs of specifically of what the women actually need and within what the children actually need, because not two person and not two families are ever the same. So, and also to do that, we have to come from a client center approach that would actually systematically look at the trauma of that, whatever the children and the family actually went through in order for us to properly advocate for them. And then for the last question, why are we separating two-spirited women? We are not. This transitional house, because of the issue that absolutely angered me of 16 people being left behind because the, the data could not actually understand oh, the cultural perspective of it is wow. why this transitional units are being built. It's because it will be for women, children, mm -hmm. and two-spirited, however they identify for them to come in. And when it comes from us, we see every day, we give food. And I personally talk to the homeless indigenous folks that come to my door every day. And I have put people in the hotels and I have walked with them and I have taken them and I have closed them and I have fed them. And I see, and this is why I'm here because I have actually gone talk to them. My staff have actually gone and talk to them. And we have actually quote unquote, compare numbers and the numbers are astronomical to the fact that there is a lack of understanding about what is the family unit. And the Euro-Canadian definition of the family unit is not the same definition of what is an indigenous family unit. And that is a cultural component that is not being addressed in any of the systemic housing models that are being put forward. So this is my first, first approach. If, if BNH has never come to council, this is my first kind of offering of how can we build relationship and how we can build collaboration. Thank you. Thanks. So what is the time of the submission for your proposal? Thank you. So it will be, again, uh, the end of the month. Okay, so, so the, we're kind Hence, of running on the 11th is, yeah, hour here. So that's what I've been trying to advocate to see how I could secure an audience with yourself. Right, and these, these usually go always annually, right? So they start right at the beginning of the year. Of the year. Is there any further questions or comments?
Okay, seeing or hearing none, uh, looking to how council would like to proceed. Again, I, I have gauged the conversation <clears throat> and rather, and, uh, and do appreciate again, Alma, that you, you know, reaching out and wanting to build the, the relationship I, that was last month, right, that you had reached out. So yeah. again, you know, we're looking to, we're looking to still further that, that relationship. Again, Brantford Native Housing has been in, in a, how long has Brantford Native Housing been in place? 30 years. 30 years. So last month, like, I mean, I think we could have been having even more of a better relationship in the last, you know, 29 years, right? So at the I end of the day, here, I think so there's more collaboration. <laughs> I, I see that and we're so appreciative. Thank you so much. At the end of the day, uh, looking to see what next steps and how council would like to proceed. Again, I've heard more conversation in terms of collaboration and partnerships. I mean, will that have another, uh, a you know, a different effect if we then now look to our own projects on the territory? Uh, uh, regardless, again, these are all our members, so we're looking to further support. So just looking to see how council would like to proceed. I see Audrey has her hand raised. Audrey, you have the floor. I just want to be clear. Is this a part of funding from CMH? Um, see, is it being money that is targeted for both on reserve and off the reserve that we're both fighting for that money? Um? No, it is not money that we're fighting. And uh, there is funding for urban and reserve, and I'm not even going near it without a proper partnership. And this money is actually not, this is the main street funding, it's not even the indigenous stream. But like that, it leaves it open for collaboration and partnership, and there is flow between reserve and non-reserve. So I guess will you be asked, working with the, is the other one due at the same time? Were you working collaboratively with, with Six Nations? The Indigenous funding? I, I'm not applying for that funding. This is the mainstream funding. Um, I would love to have that funding and we will all actually do collaboration. Um, I would love to be invited to this council again and actually pitch another idea of collaboration with some of the land that we currently have um, to build amazing projects together. But this funding is off reserve and is not um, not impeding within Six Nations funding. Well, Steve, that makes a difference for me. I, I'd like to make a motion that we give her a letter of support. There's a motion on the floor moved by Audrey. Is there a seconder? Second by Helen. Are there any further questions or comments? Nathan? Yeah, I guess, you know, I'm not really speaking to the motion, um, but uh, there is some. I have hesitancy because of the the way we were introduced in terms of this relationship, and um, you know I'll, I'll likely support the motion going forward. Um, but when you look at and and it just what sparked me is is your past comment is is you were you look forward to coming back to this council before you come back to this council. I would like you to work with our expert matter experts are, are people on the ground within the first uh, within the community um, to really to come up with that need and, and like I said I need to see the strong program you know the bricks and mortar is one thing and that's an important aspect of things but when we look to actually do that shift and that transition of people's lives that goes down to the importance of programming and I get your point earlier around you still need to collect the data and, and you need the, the facility there where's the data from the last 29 years? And, and how, what does that show and what does that tell? Um, so uh, for me, you know, I would like, um, I would like to see uh, you work with our, our folks, our frontline workers, uh, our directors, um, and, and come up with a really robust plan before you come back to see us next time. 
if, if that's helpful. Because oh, we're, yes, we're, not, we're not the ones that do, we're not frontline workers, right? We're not the ones that do the important work within the community. Um, we need, I, I would need you to go out there and work with our staff to come up with that programming going forward, how that relationship's gonna be sustained um, and, and, and go forward. Because now we have to reverse the last 29 years of, of not talking to each other, right? So it's not just us, uh, it's, it's the frontline workers and it's the directors and it's important people in our community like Sandy, uh, who's gonna speak next that uh, do this work and know it inside and out. So Nathan, thank you so much for your for such a suggestion. I have been in talks with the housing at Six Nations in terms of uh, projects and initiatives. Um, so that is a conversation that is truly and like I say, I wouldn't dare come to this council without being invited in private and even advocated for privately audiences. So I have had conversations um, in terms of how do we work collaboratively and I'll be honest with you, um, there is some, um, I think, which is normal bureaucratic -ish barriers that have come in order for us to fulfill a plan that would work collaboratively with each other. And I absolutely agree with programming. I absolutely agree. Bricks and waters are just, I call it cement and bricks. But if there's no contents, and this is what's very important for me when I said, how do we make a home, a house, is so significant to me. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you, Alma and Nathan. I have Sherry Lynn and then over to Michelle. Hi. Uh, um, I'm just taking, um, same as what Nathan's saying. I don't want to repeat everything that Nathan's saying. I think it's just important that we need to um, build these relationships and it's at the boots, you know, <laughs> people who are out there um, servicing these, servicing our community members. So, and again, you know, it's, it's nice to hear that, you know, the homeless and stuff, but when you go and ask them who's helping you and they say nobody, that's a concern for me. And I, if, and I would hope they would say some kind of agency, <laughs> but uh, I didn't get that. So um, again, just what um, Nathan said and uh, more of a plan and working, working with us and that's all departments because you talked about child welfare. Where does Ogwani Dow fit in this? Um, those kinds of things, understanding all that also. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Sherry Lynn. I have Michelle next and we'll look to uh, the motion. Michelle? Can we actually hear from, our, from Sandy before we make a decision? Sure, I have no problem with that. I have Sandy, her presentation did you, would you like forward. To... Sorry, Sandy, did you have any comments? Uh, about the presentation? Yes. Um, I, what I can tell you is that Gunokwashwa does refer to Brant Native Housing a lot. Uh, we do uh, refer, and of course, housing is, you know, is always an issue. Uh, so we, we go, they'll go to Hamilton, um, Brantford, wherever, wherever individuals can go for housing. Um, I, I'm just not sure. I mean, if Alma says there's two streams, I'm just not aware of, of the, that there is two streams. If she says it, then there must be, but I'm not, I'm probably cause I'm just so focused on the indigenous stream, I guess. Seems to me a while back, I did hear that there were two streams. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I just think that um, our people are, do go to Brantford, just like you're all saying. And um, uh, we do, we have a relationship with Brant Native Housing. Um, we do refer there a lot. Um, we sometimes get referrals, not too often do we get referrals back though, but we do refer for like for housing. Um, uh, that's pretty much what I what I would say. So you're saying the application Sorry, ahead, putting, you're saying the application they're putting forward would complement the the work you're doing on the territory. 
I think so. I think so. I think as long, even if you want to specify urban indigenous, I don't think it'll be an issue. I really don't because we're only asking, I'm not, I'm not sure how many units, um, houses Alma's looking at building, but we're only asking for six. So that's not a whole lot. Um, and, but I think even if you wanted to de specify that stream, um, urban indigenous, and then and then hopefully <laughs> support our, my initiative as well for on reserve. I mean, I think that can be done. Sure. So, sorry, Sandy. So there's two. So I am not going for the um, indigenous stream. Okay. I'm just going for the mainstream through CMAC. C okay. So my goal is to have some of the houses. So I'm, I'm transforming my eight house to 12 um, houses and have the larger houses, which is one of the, the most systemic, as you know, like most of our families, our families that are much larger and they need to have that space mm -hmm. for them to have like a different um, programming associated with them. And mm -hmm. if after the six years, we could have that relationship with, between six nations and urban, and there's not this systemic cut, like if you're not urban, you can't come in, you have to leave the reserve in order to come in. Very similar to our current transitional houses that you, whether you are in the res, or you want to come in and out, it doesn't matter. I, I see no problem with it, Chief Hill. I, I just think that, you know, our so many of our, our people are in Brantford and um, I think it, you know, I'm just, it would be nice to have certain number designated for our, our, our women. That would be very nice to have certain yeah. number percentage designated for indigenous. I and have that's, and that's, absolutely that's, exactly that. the, that's exactly the type of uh, the type of partnerships and collaborations that, that I'm talking about as well, Sandy. Is mm -hmm. you know when we do go and do these types of letters of support and so forth, you know the collaborations and partnerships. I think it needs to be clearly defined in terms. We got to get creative in a sense, right? right? And how you know we have obviously our on reserve issues with housing. We have lots of members, as we're all seeing in the surrounding areas. Like you know, we also have property in Brantford. Is that an opportunity? To partner even further with property uh, in Brantford to do build our own and you know things like that. That's exactly where I'm coming from in terms of you know the the pieces of create creativity. I see Darren. Uh, Darren has his hand raised. Uh, yeah. Yes. Thanks, Chief, and I really appreciate the conversation because this is very strategic in the sense that um, when you create space in a market that hasn't created space or the proper space or acknowledge the, that there's a need for space. I think, you know, a letter of support, we, we need to be careful in terms of how we craft that letter, that it also is copied to the city of Brantford and, and to the, the county of county of Brant, uh, just to just to say, and, and by the way, this is not the truth data, the truth data is coming, we expect you to come to the table and create those spaces for our people in the, in the city. So I, I just wanted to kind of offer those those suggestions that this is this is a strategic move. Um, I, I, I think it's a good idea, given what Sandy said. I think that clarifies a lot for, for me as well. But certainly a comprehensive housing needs strategy, uh, which we've done for the territory, will, in, will be inclusive somewhat for those having to live in the urban area uh, that, will, that will completely defeat the statistic Stats Canada data, which is underestimated. But I think the important pieces are here that it's, it's a multilateral approach where we also work with the city in the county to put them on notice that you need to create space. Uh, this is all part of the Helderman tract as well. So I'll just stop there. There's a few, few other things I could say, but uh, I think it's it's worthwhile um, at this point. We'll work on, we'll continue yeah, to work on our relationship. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, well, those are fantastic uh, comments, Darren. Thank you for, for providing your input. I think at the end of the day, we all have the common goal, right? There's commonality, housing, helping our people, making sure that we have the necessary supports and services. Uh, and again, that's exactly what we're talking about when we talk about relationship. Uh, but I think that has to get a step further, even to Nathan's point, uh, to you yourself, Alma. Again, welcome to your role. Uh, but again, as you heard Councillor Helen speak, you know, she, she's never seen Brantford Native Housing come to council. So I'm not sure if that's something that obviously, you know, further needs to be worked on so that we can be able to have these uh, these conversations and this collaborative discussion. Uh, I, I, I know we're well over. We have two more uh, delegations on time. I apologize. I know uh, Alma, uh, you know, do recognize that uh, there may have been times I had 
been cut short for your responses, but at the end of the day, I mean, I think it's uh, the discussion's been worthwhile in terms of where we go from here uh, in the next steps, and we'll look to actually drafting if the motion is supported and passed uh, in terms of Darren's comments of strategy and being strategic in terms of what all uh, the letter entails itself of the letter of support. So that being said, is there any further questions or comments in relation to the motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Favor. Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. I move, Audrey. Moved by Audrey, seconder. I'll second. Second by Helen to waive second reading. And just want to acknowledge Sandy's comment in the chats. Perhaps the letter can state half the housing unit to be designated as Indigenous specific housing. So maybe that's something that we could also look to in terms of the letter of support as well, just to have that strategic approach to it. So I do appreciate that and agree with your comments, Sandy. All in favor for second reading? Mark, if I could before you go. Isn't, oh, Bradford, my native, isn't Bradford native housing for natives? So... 100% native people? 100%, correct. So why are we limiting ourselves to 50%? Just do midstream. No, I'm, I'm, I think that's more specific to Six Nations members is what I believe Sandy's comments are, if I'm not mistaken. That's fine. Because that's that, is it all Six Nations members? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That They're is all why Six Nations. I purposely went through the mainstream. So all Six Nations, old urban will come to our uh, to our transitional housing instead of just designating it. Okay, I appreciate that. There's a further clarification points as we're moving along the discussion here. Uh, so there's been a motion to waive second reading. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing that motion is carried. Okay, well, thank you, Alma, as well as uh, Claire for joining us this evening. I uh, do look forward even further to how this relationship can work uh, in the future collaborations and our office will be following up with the letter of support that was just passed this evening. So thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Miigwech. Have a great evening. Okay, that leads us in. I'm pretty sure we had a, a lengthy conversation uh, that is pretty similar to the next delegation. So I want to welcome our Executive Director of Gnooker Shroff, Sandy uh, Montour, uh, this evening to General Counsel. And maybe what I'll do is just pass the floor right over to yourself, Sandy. Hello, everybody. Thank you for um, making, making the time and allowing me to come. I don't have a big presentation. I'm actually at a hockey game here and sitting in my car. Um, I'm just, um, what we're looking at is we're looking at building six more units at Guyana Washra. And just, to, just so that you know, Guyana Washra does adhere to our residency bylaw. So we do, it is specific to Six Nations band members. Um, and that's our priority. Well, actually that is our, that is who we, we make sure we house at, the, at that complex. And our, we currently have eight units there. There's currently eight units there. And we have been in existence. We have, Diana Washer was built in 1994. So we're almost 30 years old. Um, we currently already have funding for some workers. So we already have um, a supervisor and we already have funding for a counselor. And there's already a transitional support worker there. That's the location of, of our sexual assault healing center. And that's the location of our anti-human trafficking unit. So what we, this funding came up and what I was thinking of doing is I just thought of all the people that I'm just aware of the housing issue at Six Nations. And so what we did is we partnered with Mark um, and um, he also is working with, we worked with um, the two row, two row, um, is that the name of them? Um, I'm thinking of Brian Porter. Brian Porter's organization, they're also on board with 
with Mark Jamison, MJ Construction, and we developed housing units. And just so you know, when we first when we first proposed the housing units back in 1994, it was for more than what what was built, able to be built there. But because of funding, we weren't able to extend it to to include everything that that um, the number of units that we originally projected. And it was originally built by CMHC, and this funding is also for CMHC. So this this will provide us with six more units on top of our eight. So we'll be able to provide housing to uh, 14 families. And this will comprise of one three bedroom, um, two, two two bedrooms, single unit apartments and a four bedroom unit for our larger families. So, um, and we're asking for uh, our total ask is 2.7 2.7 million to do this build um and this is one of the requirements of course there's a lot of it's a based on a point system so it's a lot of you know asking for letters from all our partners asking for letters and getting the original bcr from when guyana washware was first built back in 1994 making sure the land like everything right so it's it's based on a point system as i'm sure um, the previous presenter shared with you and um, and it is due the same time as well which is next week and so I'm just uh, I'm just hoping that council would would be supportive of this this initiative Melba, I'll move on the recommendation just uh, just uh, thank you uh, Melba I do have a couple hands, but since uh, she has moved, is there a seconder? And I'll go to questions. I'll second, Chief. A second by Nathan. Further questions, comments, Michelle? What a question, Chief. Yeah, Nathan was oh. first. Oh, my apology. Sorry, I thought you were just seconding Nathan's. I'll go over to Nathan and then over to Michelle. <laughs> And it's just a quick one, just to confirm that the, the actual location is 36 Sunrise Court for the additional housing. Yes. And yes. that's okay. That's been yes. secured and all that stuff. So, okay. That was, that was my question. Okay, thank you. Just, just, so you, <laughs> just so you know, um, our pro we're very proud of our programming we have there because we we teach life skills. So a lot of the people to come into Guyana Washra, they usually come from shelter. So they stabilize in shelter and then they decide, okay, I don't have, I don't want to go back to my abusive relationship. I'm going to, I would like to apply it. And then we really make it clear, this is a program. It's not just housing, you know, it's a program. There's expectations there that they participate in program. And a lot of our programming involves them being certified, like getting certified in different things to break that cycle of poverty that a lot of our people are in. So we try to make, we try to provide um, uh, certification in different things to make them more marketable. So if they choose to get a job or, or you know, to pursue education that, you know, it would make them, it would help them to be able to get employment. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Much, uh, Sandy, for uh, for highlighting those pieces. I think we need more uh, of those across the board when we talk about different programming and services as well, um, just to yeah. further help and assist our members. Uh, Carrie, yeah, uh, Sandy, um, would any men have any any of the units, sir? Men are like if, if yes. Men are. Yeah. All, we do. We actually are. We have men regularly in our shelter. And we have men regularly at Guyana Washra. We don't discriminate okay. um, if, if you know, again, if they're if they meet the qualifications, if they're in need of safety and protection, um, they've come into the shelter. Um, but yes, we have men there with their families as well. We have men there now. Okay. And you mentioned uh, temporary. What, what's the uh, time limit on, on the two years the temporary? They're there for, they can be there for up to two years. Yes. That's great. Okay. And Chief, that one, one um, comment that was made <laughs> about, um, about the previous presenter about uh, 
reserving all the units for Six Nations in, in Brantford on uh, native housing. I wonder if that would jeopardize Sandy's application if they're saying, well, you're getting all these units in Brantford. Would, would that in any way um, jeopardize? Well, well she, think? she further clarified that, that, they're, that there's two separate streams. So this would be a, a, a totally different stream of funding. Uh, just wait. Yeah, okay. And I suppose as long as it's not in the, the motion, it'd be okay. Just wait. Well, I think, it, yeah, I, in terms of our letter of support to the previous presenter as well, we're going to be a little bit strategic, I think, in, in that writing of that letter. So regardless of which, I mean, we're looking to support all areas, right? So, um, I mean, at the yeah. end of the day, if there's two streams, I think that's going to be the, the, the kind of um, the crux of it all. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thanks, uh, Kiri. I see Darren has his hand raised. Darren? I'm oh, sorry, Helen, you're not on mute. Oh, I'm talking to my dog. <laughs> it's bugging me to go out. I'm saying, just a minute. She's she's probably talking because I'm going to speak to some of the, some of the uh, comments that Helen has made by email. Uh, we are doing a, a comprehensive housing needs assessment for the community. And I know, Chief, we talked about this at the art at the agenda review team as well. Uh, one of the things it's delayed because of some issues with the consultant that we hired, um, family issues, I guess, health issues. But part of it is really putting it into a chart, a uh, matrix, um, and doing basic, basing it on our, our demographics, our, our community needs. And, you know, Sandy, what Sandy's describing in terms of time frames, eligibility, programming that, that's associated with these units, it would be a descriptor for any kind of inventory that is available or should be available. And I think that's something that's way overdue. Uh, we have waiting lists. I know Karen does, is good with providing reports to BNI on what the waiting lists are, and, and predominantly it's one bedrooms. Um, but you know they have different needs; that they're not all the same, and it doesn't fit in doesn't fit neatly into a commercial housing program. So that's where the collaboration comes. And so I'm really looking forward to that report, which is overdue, um, but at the same time having that inform our infrastructure plans and vice versa. So um, I just wanted to make those comments. And um, I mean, obviously the need is there. I'm, I'm a big advocate for, if we can put up more units, let's put them up. And if we can always repurpose them if necessary into the future. So I'll just, I'll just pause there. Thanks. I think it's a, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for providing that uh, input and feedback. Uh, Darren, is there any further questions or comments to the motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? I'm going to go to the vote. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. Move. Second reading. Malba. Move. Moved by Melba. Seconder. Yeah, Nathan. Second by Nathan. All in favor to waive second reading? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, Sandy, so we'll, uh, we'll work from the chief's office to get you uh, the BCR and the letter of support and obviously wish you all the best in what we're all trying to do and working to get housing addressed. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you, Nyawa. Have a great evening. Uh, okay, Council, that does lead us into our next uh, delegation. Uh, Ruby uh, Jacobs and the, the Gavanillo uh, board. I'll maybe just uh, just for timing, I'm going to just pass the floor right over to yourself, Ruby. we got a big day tomorrow. I'm sure everybody's all getting prepared for the minister's visit. So let's, uh, let's pass the floor to you, Ruby. Thank you very much, Mark and Council, for having us tonight. Um, this, this is really an important time for Gawaneo to be here tonight because we are um, looking for the BCR that is requested by Indigenous Services Canada to um, as, as a, a step in um, the approval process for the funding for the construction for this, this school. I know you got Kevin's name up there. Uh, he's, um, 
he's on holiday and um, the person that was designated tonight is ill. So they, they let me know that. So I'll just give you a little tiny update on um, what's been um, happened in the last um, time since we saw you. We've actually um, had approval from ISC for the design brief, which is a huge move. There was very little um, corrections that had to be done and Kale Martin did those and they were accepted and we received the letter to say that they approved the design brief and, and we need this BCR approval. And um, the following that there'll be the um, program action request to fill out and Warren has already got most of that done. So it, 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 it feels like there's a favorable move forward in the process here because of um, the acceptance and how quickly it happened. And um, it, it, it's, it's um, our hope that um, with this um, BCR from council that we can move another step forward to getting the funding for this school. So it's, um, I don't need to take a long time. You're well aware of the project. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure all of the counselors and we have the four reps on our, our groups that work on this project. So we are so thankful for that. And um, it's helped a lot. And um, I think um, I'll, I'll just say that you have the BCR before you and, um, and have seen it. So we, we would, so appreciated if you could move and second it and we could send that um, BCR off to ISP for the next step. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruby, for, uh, for walking us through that. Uh, just gonna open the floor up for any questions, comments. I see Nathan has his hand raised. Just wondering if it is a concern that we actually put a physical number of our population in there, which is quite low, um, and, and kind of have that in a clause that also talks about projections for 20 years. Is that, was that a, like a requirement? Yes, they have to go by the data that they, they collect, and, it, and that's what it, it said. That's okay, and, that, and those are ISC numbers, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I just wanted to share one other point with you. The, the um, site serve thing, uh, bids are out now. And as of Friday, the contractors came to meet with Kale Martin's team to um, ask questions on the site servicing that's going to take place. Uh, and that, that's out there now and, and bids are happening. So the project is starting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruby. Sorry, Nathan. Is there any further follow up questions? No, it's just worded weirdly, but I get, I get it. <laughs> thank you, Nathan. Uh, that was that was one of my questions as well, just because of the population piece. But if ISK is saying that and the, their numbers, I mean, that's the other challenge. That's another story that we need to talk about with ISK in relation <laughs> to some of their their numbers. Uh, yeah, and Audrey. My concern is is the the eighteen hundred and and is that clause actually saying that we're projecting our population to be at eighteen three sixty five by twenty forty one? They mean just the on reserve number <laughs> of people. Currently, right at at this period in time. Mm -hmm. That's what it should be. Population for for the period ending. They had to do it up to 2041, so that's what they're saying. It, you know that they go by something, what is it right now? Do you, do you folks know what, what it is what they go by right now? Yeah. And I, yeah, is it? and I think that, 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 that's part of our challenge though, right? Is, 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 is that formula funding that they use is not totally reflective of the reality. I think that's part of the problem. I mean, well, but again, they, that's not a that's not a KG. That's not a Gavanil issue. This is a that's a ISK issue that yeah. we need to talk about. Yeah. I think regardless of which, I, I get your point though, Nathan. I think we got to be you know for if this is looking for ISK requirement, 
I mean, if they're saying uh, this to move it as quickly as possible, uh, you know, we're having the minister down tomorrow. I mean, our, our goal is to push and assert as much political pressure as possible. So, you know, obviously something must be working. Um, Audrey, and then over to Michelle. Yeah, I'd like to move this motion, please, as well as I've been on here for about four years, five years on the Governing Design Board, and I totally support Governing getting a new school. Yeah. It is a motion on the floor, uh, moved by Ms. Uh, Audrey, is there a seconder? I'll second it, Melba. Second by Michelle. Thank you, Melba. Uh, Michelle was just uh, before you, and I'll look to a question, follow up question back to Michelle. So, I guess my concern is I believe we've already sem sent supported with a BCR in $2 million, right? So, why is it? And I guess this is a conversation we should have tomorrow with ISK is why are they making Gaunio come back and ask for another BCR? It just seems like step upon yeah. step and to me we get no way doing that so um yeah I'll, I'll second it yeah that's that's a good point michelle in fact that's partly what we constantly are fighting in terms of their bureaucratical processes uh you know that's 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 the is game uh, and when you go back and look to you know having to get these necessary steps in place it's all just a bureaucratical process. So that's something that we got to further look at in terms of, you know, moving forward on future projects. Mark, Is there any further questions or comments to the motion? Sorry, Ruby. Could, could you waive second reading or you got to, or am I ahead of you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you're so excited, Ruby. I, I hear you loud and clear. Yeah. I just want well, they've been waiting just, 40 I, years, Mark. So. No, no, no. I, I, I get it. Trust me. We're, you have the utmost support. You continue to get the utmost support. Uh, oh, I just you. really quickly, I see I see Alva has her hand raised. Hi. It's uh, Rose. To answer Michelle's question about why they're making us, why they're making us come back to you for another BCR. They're making us come back to you for another BCR is because According to Maria, they need a new BCR attached to the to all this other stuff, to all this paperwork to address the cost share. That's what the new BCR has to say. So that's why they need a new BCR. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Rose, for that yep. clarification. Uh, is there any further question or comments in relation to the motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Favor. Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. I move, Audrey. I'll second. Moved by Audrey and seconded by Michelle. All in favor? Favor. Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, so Ruby, you have um, you have your motion, you have your second reading. We'll look to yeah. again get that get that over to you as quickly as possible. So Tammy, uh, if we can make note uh, that yeah. we'll get the BCR uh, to uh, the the rightful individuals, um, and hopefully that that can be done first thing in the morning. Uh, and then we'll also look to uh, getting uh, prepared for our visit with Minister Mark Miller tomorrow. So I hope to see you uh, looking forward to tomorrow. Thank you, Mark. You'll be there, right? All, with all yes. your team. Thank you so much, yes. folks. This is for the children and for the generations. That we got to look for the, the seven generations ahead. So this is what we, we, all, we all agree. Yeah, so Thank much, you. Ruby, and everybody for all of your work. Yeah. Okay, Council, thank you. Have a great evening. We'll see you all tomorrow. Uh, okay, Council, that does complete our portion of the delegations for this evening's General Council. I'm going to shift right in and going back to the agenda. So I'll lead us into the adoption of the General Council minutes of May 10th. I'll move on the minutes. Okay, it's moved by Helen. Is there a seconder? 
I'll second, it's Hazel. Second by Hazel. Are there any further questions or comments in relation to the minutes? I do, Mark. It's Melba. Yeah, is there sure, go ahead. Really, does, that, does that include when you couldn't be here, you were elsewhere and needed people to replace you? So that was the, it was, are you referring to the events? Yes. Yes. Okay, in here is missing the Stedman Hospice. You asked somebody to attend on the 15th of May. It's not in the minutes. I can't see it anyhow. And I w just wanted to say that I did attend. Um, and there was a lot of history attached to when they first started in the past. And uh, uh, people were very present there. A lot of people where they fundraised for uh, hike for hospice and other related activities for the community. And I certainly brought you a t-shirt. So I'd like you to uh, know and others that I did attend on the 15th. Thank you. Thank you so much. In fact, uh, we really appreciate that Melba as, as uh, we're kind of shifting in towards, uh, you know, post pandemic, hopefully uh, we're, we're getting a lot more events and invitations. As you can see on the, this agenda, we, we have more scheduling to do so, I'll definitely need some more further support from counselors as uh, I can't be in two places at once and we're finding a lot of conflicting. Uh, but uh, to your point, Melba, uh, I did receive a letter of thanks from the Stedman Hospice as well for your presence. So I wanna, I'll pass that on to yourself as well. So we do appreciate you attending, thank you. You're okay, is there any further questions or comments in relation to the minutes? Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? With that mm -hmm. note of change, mind you, with Melba. All in favor? Thank Any you. opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Okay, this now leads us into our next portion of the agenda, which is recommendations from the Building and Infrastructure Committee. That's been moved and seconded. Recommendation 6A1. I move. That the Building and Infrastructure Committee recommends that the six stations of the Grand River Elected Council, and whereas the six stations of the Grand River Elected Council hereby submits a band council resolution to Indigenous Service Canada, and whereas the six stations of the Grand River Elected Council are in support of conducting a capital planning study, and whereas the six stations of the Grand River Elected Council request funding from Indigenous Services Canada to proceed with a capital planning study. Therefore, be it resolved that the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Sub Council support a minor capital application to Indigenous Services Canada, Ontario region to secure appropriate funding to complete a capital planning study with this approved band council resolution. I so move. I second Hazel. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to Audrey and Hazel for that moving and seconding. And I did also catch that one piece. I think I just need to add in uh, council after elected and the therefore be resolved. Is there any further questions or comments in relation to this motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none. Uh, oh, sorry, Nathan. Yeah, just wondering the duration of um, this particular uh, study. Um, because it, it does say multi-year, but how many years is this going to take to complete? That's a good question. I'm going to actually defer that question over to Darren. Um, it's, it's set for three years, Nathan. Um, okay. We're hoping to get it done much, much quicker than that because we have done study in 06. So it's really looking at, you know, uh, how we've deviated from the original plan in 06 uh, okay. in terms of what we've done since. And then... Projecting, projecting forward, working with our infrastructure task force as a steering committee. Okay, so it's almost a gaps analysis as well. Well, Basically. well, yeah, but then, but then, like, okay, what does that? You have to almost retool it because you know yeah. because we've deviated. Our infrastructure has also deviated to support whatever facilities we've constructed since '06. So now we're going to have to reforecast. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, uh, thank you, Darren. Are there any further questions or comments in relation to the motion? Okay, 
Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading. I move. I second. Moved by Audrey, second by Hazel to waive second reading on the previous motion. All in favor? Favor. Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Uh, recommendation 6B1. I move that the uh, Building and Infrastructure Committee recommends to the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council that whereas the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council approved a funding submission to the Rail Safety Improvement Program for the extension of the hydro infrastructure and the installation of the warning signals and bell at the Pauline Johnson Road Railway, Railway Crossing. And whereas Hydro One requires that Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council to sign a customer service contract to provide service to these safety devices. Therefore, that the Six Nations of the Grand River Elected Council approve the chief and councillors to sign the Hydro One customer service contract for lot 54 Onondaga Township to service the railway crossing of mile 25-0.76 Hagersville subdivision. I so move. I second, Hazel. Okay, thank you, Audrey and Hazel. This has been a long time coming. I know we've received multiple uh, you know, community concerns on the safety of this railway. So I'm really happy to see this uh, you know, come uh, to the table and get started and get to completion. Are there any questions or comments in relation to 6B1? Nathan. Yeah, just the status of the funding submission, I, I guess more or less the when we can actually get this completed. Um, I, I prefer not to see it two years down the road and for looking at like a six month turnaround, that'd be great. Yeah, to, to my understanding, it's, it's, it's supposed to be started in the next uh, like month. Oh, that, okay. That's what was my conversation with the director of public works. So I'm just wondering, uh, to be honest, it's, it should be complete uh, rather sooner than later. Perfect. Just, uh, and thanks for that, Nathan. Just uh, if I can, for consistency purposes to our recording secretary on the last uh, paragraph after therefore, if they can include be it resolved, so therefore comma be it resolved and then that the Six Nations of the Grand River elected, if it could read that please and thanks. Is there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Favor. Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Motion to waive second reading? I waive. I second, Hazel. Moved by Audrey, second by Hazel to waive second reading on the previous motion. All in favor? Favor. Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Okay, we're now shifting into our next portion of the agenda, which is under scheduling. As mentioned, there's a number of invitations and events coming through the office, and we're looking to make sure that we get to as many as we can. Um, so that I'm going to just maybe if I can uh, pass the floor over to Tammy. Tammy, are you able just to walk us through uh, the first uh, three, or rather the three under scheduling? Sure. So the first one you'll see is happening on June 21st and 22nd at the Sanderson Center. So the request came in for the chief to, to, to welcoming for each of those evenings. However, the chief is going to be in two other events on June 21st. So we need a counselor to step in to help uh, help do that welcoming. So it would be nice to have, um, and it's totally optional depending on counselor's availability, to have perhaps maybe the same counselor do both evenings, or if, if it doesn't fit in this agenda, then just designate two specific counselors for one for the June 21st and one for June 22nd. Okay, I see, uh, thanks. I see Nathan is available for both evenings to uh, to do this. Is, uh, is there a motion to approve Nathan to attend? I'll move it, Sherilyn. Moved by Sherry Lynn, seconder. Second. 
second by Michelle. Are there any questions, comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Really appreciate that. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, back to you, Tammy, the second one. So the second one came in through a letter and invitation, and this is happening on July, July the 9th, which is a Saturday. And of course, many of our community members access Lansdowne's Children's Center. Our, uh, our social services has a relationship with the organization as well, because we do have Six Nations community members who, who visit the Lansdowne Center. So it's something I believe that Six Nations has participated in the past. And so they were at, they were hoping that Chief was going to be available to attend. However, his schedule doesn't permit. He'll be uh, returning from the AFN uh, AGM this year, which is happening that same week. So we would appreciate it if, if a counselor could attend on behalf of council. And just just to clarify for that, Tammy, there's uh, it, they're just looking to for attendance, right? There, there's the counselor wouldn't have to speak. I think that they often welcome comments from, from Six Nations and they will make room for it. That's usually their request when you're there, they want you to speak. So if the counselor is willing to speak, I think that would be great. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Is there any takers for that event? Uh, I smell the, oh. I've, uh, I've had uh, several children over the years uh, in treatment for special needs over the years. So I will take that event. Okay, thank you uh, so much for, for, for that, Malba. Is there a motion mover and seconder for Mal Malba to attend the Lansdowne Children's Center event? I'll move. I'll move. Please. Moved, by, moved by, moved by, uh, sorry. <laughs> I just heard everybody. Moved by Hazel, second by Audrey. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Favor, favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Thank you uh, so much, Melba, for that. Um, okay, our next one is uh, for Sherry Lynn. There's two, and I actually want to be added to the second one as well, the Jade Treaty Border Law Alliance, just for the follow-up. And then I also have just one more after Sherry Lynn. So maybe if I can... I'll look to, uh, at this point, to pass the floor over to Sherry Lynn. Um, I just have one also. Um, I see the one, I thought I handed in also the Chiefs of Ontario Keyway. That is uh, Monday night at six also. That's why they did um, the one Monday, you see, during the day. And then Monday night, I have um, the Keyway meeting from six to nine. Okay, so let's let's do let's do with the first one, then Sherry Lynn, the joint uh, OCCOH meeting. So we, we'll look to a mover and seconder. Is there a mover for Sherry Lynn to attend that meeting on June thirteenth at the Toronto Airport, the Hilton Toronto Airport? Um, I'll move Melba. Moved by Melba, second by Nathan. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. And then your second one that you just mentioned, Sherry Lynn, the sorry, the Chiefs of Ontario, Kiwi. I'll look um, to yeah, a mover. That is, yeah, that one. Thanks. Okay, and that's the same date, correct? Um, yep, that's the thirteenth at six to nine. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that, uh, Sherry Lynn. Is there a mover and seconder for that as well? I'll move. Moved by Audrey, seconder. Yeah. Second by Michelle. I'll second it. Any, any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Um, and then Sherry Lynn's final one, which I would like to be added in as well, just from our follow-up piece of the last Jade uh, Treaty Border Alliance. Um, this is being held at the Border Summit to take place on June 27th and 26th in Windsor, Ontario. Um, 
And then also there's a June 29th. So you see the motion in front of you. If we could just add uh, myself and Sherry Lynn for this motion. Is there a mover or seconder to that effect? I'll move. Moved by Nathan, seconder. I'll second Melba. Okay, second by um, Melba. Are there any further questions or comments? Seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. And I have also just the last one under scheduling. So as you all know, we're, we're traveling to for the, ex, the exploratory piece to Ganawage uh, with the MC, uh, the MCK. Uh, and so I know uh, Sherry Lynn, something had come up uh, for Sherry Lynn. So therefore she's unable to attend that now as well as Wendy. So I am looking for, we're attending with the gaming commission, our gaming commission uh, to take the tour and have a, uh, again, the further discussion and bring it back to full council uh, and on a full package to then make decision. Um, so I'm looking for if there's any interested uh, counselors that would also like to attend uh, this uh, Friday at in Gunawange. Is anyone available? I know it's last minute, it's quick. We're planning to leave Thursday back Friday. Okay, I'm not seeing any any interested individuals or schedules may permit. Uh, so I will uh, look to again travel with the two gaming commissioners who are confirmed uh, and then we'll look to bring uh, whatever we receive um, and the information and bring it back to the last piece of the full package that we plan to present the full council. Um, that being said, I will look for a motion of second reading to be waived on all of the scheduling motions. Is there a mover to that effect? Move. Moved by Michelle, seconded by Nathan to waive second reading on all of the scheduling motions previously. All in favor? Favor. Any opposed? Favor. Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. It's kind of weird to do scheduling uh, as we've all been on Zoom for a couple of years. <laughs> so the, the event invitations are definitely coming in. So thank you so much to those counselors. Um, you know, who are able to, to assist uh, in making sure that our presence is at these events. So, uh, We always leave, uh, we've, since our last conversation on the community safety piece, I know we've been making some strides. Actually, if I can, just really quickly, Tammy, I believe uh, you had uh, attended the last uh, anti-bullying uh, committee. Is there any update that you could provide just verbally really quickly on that piece? The last meeting that I had actually was with the, she presented to the chief's office and I believe that she was going to be presenting to the council very soon. So I'll touch base with her to find out when that's going to happen because she did want to get some further direction from, from uh, first the task force and then from council just to confirm the direction. Perfect. And there's, there's also some other pieces that we're working on as well. Uh, there, nothing is, is set in stone at this point, so I won't mention those pieces as of yet until they are all confirmed. Again, it's all in, in, in part and parcel to the overall community safety and how uh, we can, again, can keep this on as a uh, standalone item on our agenda so that we can keep the progress going uh, and track the status of where we are on certain initiatives. Um, so that being said, I'll now shift over to new business items. Uh, Hazel was first with her item and then over to Helen with her two items. Hazel, you have the floor. Yes, um, I just wanna go back and address that topic of conflict of interest that happened uh, in April and was written in uh, Turtle Island News. Um, I believe it was the... Um, May 11th edition. And uh, I just wanted to have time to express myself. And this is not meant to um, create any uh, problems anywhere, but when it came to myself in terms of uh, having to declare uh, when the Six Nations Police sent over the recommendation of the new hire for a police officer who happened to be my grandson. Um, as you notice, if you read that 
Turtle Island newspaper, um, I didn't finish my sentence because I said I thought, well, and then I just let it go. But all along, we've had many talks with legal people. We've had talks amongst ourselves. And it always comes down to the fact that um, as long as you have no financial claim to anything, you're not in a conflict. So that to me, the, the resolution that came, the recommended resolution that came from the Six Nations Police was a recommendation. And I view that as a FYI for the entire community because it was brought out of, in camera, into the open. I think it was at the request of Councillor Wendy Johnson. So that's fine, you know, he's, uh, he's a police officer in training now. And um, being his grandmother, I'm severely proud of him for that. What I feel bad about is the way I was made to feel about the discussion after, um, as it's written in a uh, Turtle Island News, it mentions the word, we have to be truthful. Um, that to me left our community with the idea that I'm not a truthful person. And to the community, I am truthful. I think what our council has failed to do is to come up with a conflict of insult, conflict of interest principles and guidelines on specific topics that fit the community. Because if we had to declare a conflict every time I would be participating in hardly anything. Example being, uh, when I brought the um, third line residents concerns, those residents that live between Cuga Road and the uh, um, railroad tracks on third line, when they were concerned about uh, another industrial building going up. After all that I tried to help the, those people with, with all of their written letters and stuff, at the end of the day, it was more that you're in a conflict. Never mind that you're trying to help those people. You're just in a conflict. And there was nothing ever accomplished or done on that topic. When Colleen Mentor and uh, Michelle Jonathan brought their new um, program or uh, Haudenosaunee Health Services to Council. Um, that to me is a community event that this whole reserve is gonna benefit from. Like, thank God we will get our own MRI, our CAT scans and our X-rays for everybody instead of having to wait months down the road when somebody has been told you need to get an MRI or a CAT scan. Time is precious when you are told you got a situation, a health situation that needs immediate attention. And again, I was told I was in a conflict with that because Colleen is married to my nephew. I don't think I'm in a conflict because this is a community thing. And what I'm trying to say here is, and well, there's just one more that I wanted to address. Even when my brother as a farmer asked me one day, who do you contact to see if you can rent ban land? I says, I'm not sure, but I'll find out. So I asked in council that night, I became chastised. You're in a conflict of interest and you're unprofessional. Now, this has happened too many times for me to not say anything now. I'm at the same point now. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but I think it's time that our council um, drafted up some kind of regulations on certain topics that allows the Six Nation councillors to participate in events and communication that's going to affect this whole reserve. Um, for that uh, wording in the, in the paper that I had to be truthful. That's another way of saying you're a liar and I am not a liar. I think we've, we've had it 
shoved down our throats since we began as a council. You have to be transparent and accountable, transparent and accountable on every topic there is. Just in the last week or so, I heard an event where I'm going to ask about accountability and transparency, whereby someone wanted a land transfer into the Six Nations General Council agenda ASAP. And that manager was ordered to provide it against her policies and the procedures of when things are late, it's gonna to have to wait until the next session. Now, to me, that's not right. If somebody can ask a special request that their family's issue can get addressed sooner. Remember, we're, we talk about using those two words, responsible, accountable, and transparent. So we have to do that for everybody across the board, no depending on who you are. So thank you for allowing me this time to, to, for me to have my say. I feel like I've been classified as in conflict of interest way too many times and it does nothing but tie your hands behind your back as a counselor. When I was elected by the people to be their counselor and act on their behalf. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hazel, for, for bringing this item forward. Uh, again, you know, I agree with your points of we need to have, we need to have a cold really governance manual. That's what it comes down to is code of conduct so that people understand. And not just for this council, for future councils that are coming on board, you know, onboarding transition, you know, all those, uh, th these are all important pieces uh, that I think this governance manual needs to definitely uh, happen sooner than later to also look to how we, again, look to the steps of what it means on some of these pieces. So I do appreciate uh, you bringing this item forward. I never read the, the, the newspaper, so I don't know what that says. Uh, but at the end of the day, again, you know, you had your time and I do appreciate uh, your, you uh, addressing this matter and we look forward to making this better. I mean, at the end of the day, we have bigger fish to fry uh, and I wanna be able to have nice, uh, you know, respectful dialogue and conversations with all of us across the board um, and so, you know, this has been something that's been festering, like you say, for some time, this whole conflict of interest policy and what that looks like. So I look forward to, uh, you know, this governance manual and how we can, like you say, look to the protocols of what, this, what a conflict of interest is in so that we're all on the same page when it comes to this discussion. Is there any further questions or comments in relation to Hazel's new item? I have one. Uh, I do. It's, oh, so I'll be next if I can be after. All right, thank you. I have Carrie, Carrie. and then over to Melba. Carrie, you have the floor. You know, for the last <clears throat> 25, 30 years, we've been following Robert's rules of order. And it seems like it's been working because there, there's we haven't had any conflicts like this over that time. Maybe Maybe a couple of minor things, but for that time when I was in council back in that, mid 80s to present day it, it's worked but it seems like with this i don't know this this year or last year or whatever it just things have been happening that well it was just basically what uh hazel said so that's something we gotta we gotta look at it seems to have been working for 30 years and all of a sudden it's not thank you Thanks, uh, thanks, Carrie, for, for your comments as well. Uh, Melba. Yes, I think uh, I've mentioned also people in the paper concerning uh, Darren, maybe Darren, uh, CEO, maybe Mark, yourself, and maybe Matt. All of these relationships, and it was mentioned relationships, and as far as I'm concerned, we have healthy relationships with our present council, and hopefully the community sees that. We're here for the business and benefit, effective benefit of the community, which Hazel has mentioned. So when Darren has to deal with his brother, it's for the community. It's not for him. And yourself, Mark, when you deal with your brother, it's not for you, it's for the community. So I think the community 
should hear this loud and clear. When Matt deals with Darren, his brother, for example, the same thing. So we should open our minds and use a good mind in understanding what the elected council, others, and the Haudenosaunee are trying to do for the community. So hopefully we, we're going to put this to rest until we come up, as you said, a governance uh, area with principles and guidelines that we can move forward with the way we think, the way we are, and the good mind should be involved in it, always using a good mind with honesty and courtesy and respect, all those principles that uh, comes with who we are. Let's try to move forward with that and, and deal healthily with each other in council and continue to deal with the community that way concerning business for the benefits of the community. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Thanks, uh, Melba. And, and you're exactly right. You know, we have to look at the bigger picture. There's a bigger picture here to be, uh, you know, focused on. So, you know, once we get into the pieces and what you just mentioned, the guidelines and, you know, governance manual, that will hopefully suffice this conversation. Um, Michelle. I still think though we're missing what our community has always told us. It's a perception, right? I'll use my example of, you know, my father-in-law's on farmers. I'll exclude myself from the conversation because should the farmers get money, they're going to say, oh, Michelle knew. Michelle knows the money that's coming into the station and, you know, tells so-and-so to the trust. We have to build trust with community. And by declaring those conflicts, we're taking that away. And for me, I would hope that as a council, we lean on each other. When I know I'm gonna be at a conflict, I tell my colleague to say, you know what, here's my points or here's you know, how we need to advocate for this. And I exclude myself. To me, that's just transparent. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Michelle for your, your comments as well. Again, uh, you know, we have, uh, like you say, uh, it's been mentioned, you know, looking at the bigger picture of business and, and what needs to get done here to progress our community. So I, I really am, am excited to see the next steps to this piece and what the governance manual looks like. So it, it, again, it helps future councils. You know, the, the people who come in or are elected next or whatever it may be, you know, they need to have, you know, the background, they need to have the historic, uh, you know, the corporate knowledge of where things have been. They need to have different, you know, policies in place and which work for those pieces. But do hear your point, Michelle, I think it's always come down to perception, uh, you know, and, and drawing to conclusion and, and, and things like that. But at the end of the day, you know, if we have these clear guidelines of communities well aware of these guidelines uh, and see these uh, pieces uh, that we follow in order to get to a decision and so forth, you know, that's also looking to the whole transparency piece of things. So I do agree. Uh, is there any further questions or comments in relation to this topic? I do, Mark, it's Audrey. Sure, uh, go for it, Audrey. Yeah, just quick. I think it's the perception of the counselors as well. I think that it's how you view things. If the farmers get money and we know the money is going to buy seed for corn, for white corn for the entire population of the reserve. The money isn't going to the farmer's pocket. It's going to feed the entire community. Those who want to participate, pick their corn, make corn soup, cornbread and all the rest of it. So we have to be clear on what the purpose is for it and not, um, um, how would I say? We have to make sure that we know what we're dealing with. And if it's for the whole community, and nobody's lining their pockets with money, then I don't see where there's a conflict of interest, especially with if they're giving back to the entire community, it's their work, it's their tools, it's their equipment. So I don't see that conflict of interest there. You know. Okay, thank Marcus, you. Uh, thank you, Audrey, for, for your comments. If I can, maybe I'm going to look to the last comments over to Hazel. Hazel, you have the floor to wrap this conversation up. Did you say my name, Mark Hazel? I did. You have the floor. Oh, sorry. I, okay, thanks. Well, exactly what Michelle is saying is exactly why we need to develop 
a conflict of interest because that farmers association and the big plans that they are working to achieve to grow food and feed this reserve is is huge it's a huge thing that's going to benefit all the people on the reserve so when when we talk about that in council why why would michelle have to not be able to say a word because her her father-in-law is a farmer i have a brother that's a farmer i have a brother-in-law who's a farmer we need the input of us because we are elected to make decisions for the community and those decisions that we talk about regardless if you got somebody who's farmer we all still need to partake in those discussions because um um it's just it's just the way that i feel about it there's some topics that we all as counselors and as melba said with darren like there's some discussions with dev just because matt and derek are brothers don't mean they shouldn't be able to even converse or in the same room that just does not make sense it's it has to do with business um decisions for our community that's where we have to focus our thoughts on rather than pointing out you know you can't talk because you're in a conflict i don't like that i just don't like it thank you okay thank you uh thank you hazel i again i do see nathan's hand up nathan i'm gonna give you the last comment i think we're going around now at this point we've made some steps to see what we got to do uh to you know get this uh further addressed so i'll, I'll pass it over to you nathan and look to our next uh, new business item nathan Dude, if i'm gonna be the last speaker i saw helen had her hand up a few times so i'll defer to helen oh my i'm so sorry uh, helen i I can't see you shifting across the screen. It's easier with your emoji. Uh, so with that yeah, I, being so nice, I just uh, wanted to Nathan, say, uh, passing over to you, Helen. I just wanted to say, uh, in my in all the years I sat on council, conflict was never an issue like this. We do have council does have a conflict of interest document, and that's what council always followed. It's only been the last couple of years that we start running into all these conflict issues. So it's something that I'm not used to running into. But, and, and, and the, all the previous councils never had an issue with the conflict of interest guideline that we had. And the one thing I don't agree with, I don't agree with another counselor pointing out conflict of interest to a colleague, even though the colleague wasn't named in a public meeting. I don't agree with that. I think the counselor that, the person that felt that way should have just waited till it came aside where she could say something to somebody, but I don't agree with another counselor declaring another counselor in conflict. So I have, I have no problem with conflict. I, I think it's up to the counselor to declare conflict if they think they're in a conflict. We're adult enough to do that, I think. We don't need to be reminded by other counselors. So it's just my thoughts. It's, it's only been, with, well, I'm going to say it. It's only been with this new council that we start running into all of these conflict issues. This has never happened in my 18 years being a counselor. Uh, I appreciate that's That's your famous uh, quote, it seems like, Helen. <laughs> It's, you've never seen it in the last 18 years. I, I didn't. I never. Just once in a Nathan, great while. Nathan, over to you. Yeah, I think this is a this is a balancing act, and and I think more is in in, in the years to come. I think more and more of it's going to become apparent. Um, because because conflict of interest laws are. They're federal and provincial laws, and they're set in place to protect people in people's interests. Um, so it's how we utilize them and how as a council we determine to utilize them that's going to be the balancing act. Um, and I'm glad to hear, you know, we're, I, 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 I do have that little booklet you all gave me um, with the governance manual in it. 
and, and I'm glad to hear that's going to be updated because I think in there that's going to have a lot of the um, not answers, but a, a, a lot, it'll put in place and make things a lot more clear going forward. Uh, because Helen's right, we do have conflict of interest policies, and and you know I I just reviewed them the other day, and they're pretty strong. I'm not sure if they need to go a little bit further or not, but I just think it goes back to uh, us as a council. Um, you know, when it does come up that we apply that particular policy fairly across the board, you know, it's, it's, and, and it's not being done right now. Um, so it's, it's, to me, it's, it's really just that simple is because I looked at it the other day, I was like, am I in conflict on this? So I had to, I read the policy and I determined for myself that I wasn't in conflict on a particular issue. Um, so, you know, we have policies. If we're going to update them, that's great. If not, use them. Let's use them. That's all I have to say. Totally, totally agree. I think you summed it up perfectly, uh, Nathan. So looking forward to, again, uh, you know, then the, the um, you know, further addressing this and, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to draw a, a conclusion to this discussion. Uh, I want to then now move on to our next new business item. Again, do appreciate the conversation. Do look forward to, you know, uh, you know, further addressing this issue and, and all being on the same page in terms of when it comes to the, the policy itself or anything further needed. But the, again, last words for me is there's a bigger picture out there. We have a lot more work happening in multi, multiple other files uh, that need uh, our time and energy as opposed to always constantly being bogged down with this item. So I'm glad we're finally, uh, hopefully, at Malba's words, putting it to rest and be able to, again, move forward in the way to focus on the bigger picture. Uh, over to you, Helen, for your two new business items. Alrighty, uh, I got a concern from some people living on Fourth Line about the Stone Ridge Church that anybody that drives by there can see it's all, <clears throat> can see it's all collapsed. Uh, some of the neighbors are concerned because kids are playing around there and uh, they would like to see that church demolished. So I talked to Jan before she retired and asked her what was the process. And she said, the land is supposed to revert back to council and it's not being used for a church. And that the church was run by a board of trustees. And she said, the board, there's only one trustee left, the rest are all dead. And I think the trustee has to do something to turn it back. But she, she never told me who the trustee was. So, because I was going to go talk to the trustee to see what they thought needed to happen, but she never told me who the trustee was. So I got a thing into Ken Sandy to see if he can identify the trustee. But we need to get the land turned back to council so, so we can demolish that building. Because like the lady said across the road and a couple of ladies across the road, they see kids playing around there. And that's the last thing you need to, is to see a kid get hurt playing around that building because it's pretty wrapped. So it needs to come down. But right now we can't do anything because it's under that church. So I got to find out who this trustee is to see what they have to do. They must, they must have some kind of rules. I'm not sure how it works, but I, don't, I think the trustee has to be the one to sign it over, I think, or sign it back. So that's just my issue there. If anybody can help me deal with that, fine. Okay. Maybe Darren, I guess, see if I can get some Matthew. answers. It's hard now because Jan is gone, so. Okay, thanks, Helen, uh, thank really for bringing this forward. If we can, uh, maybe Darren, if you can add this onto your list and we can follow up in our weekly check-ins. Uh, and bring this item back uh, for further follow-up and to look to next steps. Darren, is that okay oh, with yourself? I, I, yeah, I just wanted to say before Darren's going to speak, before, I'm, if anybody listening tonight knows who that trustee is, <laughs> I'd appreciate it if you'd give me a call and let me know, because I can go talk to them if I knew who it was. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Helen, for that. Uh, Darren? Yeah, just just quickly, um, I, Kellen's already reached out to Ken, so Ken would be the best person in terms of uh, the trustee, the board. There may be some names identified through previous motion as well, so we can research that through records. But 
Um, for sure, I can I can follow up on that. And Jan is not completely gone, by the way. She's on a contract. She's in in place until our new director starts uh, at the end of the month. Oh. So, oh, okay. Yep. Yep. So she's just off right now and on on a on a vacation at the moment. So I'll follow up with Ken. Uh, you've already reached out to Ken, so I can I can take it from okay. here. Okay. We appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Darren, for that follow up. Uh, back over to you, Helen, for your second okay. item. Okay. Oh, my other issue is I got a. Um, message from, um, I don't know how to say it, but it's, it's somebody with an Indian name. <laughs> I don't know how to say the name and I don't really know who it is. I think it might be Dakota Brandt, but I'm not sure. Uh, she's informing me that Crystal, our assistant fire chief, Crystal Farmer is receiving an award from the Fire Service Women of Ontario organization on Thursday. Um, she was recommended by former chief Mike Seth. Um, and her family is going to be present. It's going to be a you know, fairly little big ceremony, I guess. Her family is going to be present and everything. So the person that's sending it to me wanted to know if uh, somebody from council could be there. I think all us women counselors should be there to support because it is a specific award to a First Nations woman fire person. So I think it would be nice if all those women could be there. Or the chief too, if you want to attend anybody, I guess. I just want the council to know so we could attend. It's going to be at fire station number one. I'm assuming that's the one in the Schwiegen. And um, so that's that's it. I just hope somebody, I told him I would attend. So I'm hoping other people can attend as well. She, the only thing she didn't tell me is what time it was. So I got to find more info as to what time this is taking place at the fire hall. What's the day again, Helen? It's on Thursday, this Thursday. Okay. So sounds like a you pretty think? good award. Of fire yeah, Service most, Women of uh, Ontario Organization. I didn't most know we had a fire so. limit service of Ontario. But. Uh, most definitely. Thank you, Helen, for bringing this forward. Uh, we'll definitely look to add this into uh, my schedule as well, uh, given, given it permits to attend. But uh, looking to any other councillors who wish to attend uh, this Thursday, and we'll confirm with the time uh, via email as well. Again, I think it's a, a huge uh, achievement uh, and always looking to support our women in any way, shape, or form. So thank you, Helen, for bringing that forward. Uh, is there anything further on your end? No, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. That does conclude our new business items. Uh, we are now at a point uh, where we are at the final uh, piece of our agenda, which is the adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Moved by Michelle, seconder, second by Nathan. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Thank you to everybody for listening and joining in this evening at General Council. Uh, I hope you have a, a, a great rest of your evening and a great rest of your week. Take care. <laughs>